Time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Edmund O'Brien, starring in another adventure of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he's an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Great Columbian Life Insurance Company. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during the investigation of the circumstances surrounding the murder of your policyholder, Loyal B. Martin, or how to take a vacation in Fairfield County. Expense account item one. $3.20 mileage from Hartford, Connecticut to the country estate of the deceased. I drove up a long cement driveway toward the mausoleum-type manor house. There were rolling green lawns liberally sprinkled with statuary. And the thought occurred to me that if he had spent much of his life here, the late Mr. Martin was most fortunate. He'd feel right at home in a cemetery. Yes? My name is Dollar. I'm here to see Mrs. Martin. Oh, yes. Mrs. Martin. Uh-huh. I'm afraid I'll have to disappoint you. The widow has gone shopping the day after the death of her husband. Something attractive in morning clothes, I'm sure. Well, what time is she expected back? I have no idea. But it shouldn't be long. Do you uh, mind if I come in and wait? You'll forgive my asking, young man, but just what is your business here at Loyal Haven? I was sent here by the insurance company. Oh, why, yes. Well, then do come in. Oh, here, right in here. Uh, I'm uh, Mrs. Tompkins, the housekeeper, Mr. Dollar. I was with Mr. Martin for over 30 years. He was a wonderful man. This furniture also looks like it might have been with Mr. Martin for over 30 years. Victorian, isn't it? Yes. Pure. Loyal... Uh, Mr. Martin, that is, was an expert on the Victorian period. Uh, please sit down. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dollar, I... I suppose you'll think it's indelicate of me at this time, but, uh, About Loyal's insurance, his policies, uh, did they... Yes, uh, Mrs. Tompkins, they did. One of his policies leaves you a nice, sizable amount. But before you start counting it, maybe you and I had better have a little understanding. Yes? Well, I'm not here to represent the payoff department... I'm here to investigate the murder. Oh, I see. Yes, before the company pays off, they want to make sure that among the beneficiaries, they don't pay off the murderer, because they they really don't have to do that. Oh, I didn't realize... No, neither do a lot of people. You know, that's the way quite a few good murders are wasted. Yes, I suppose you're right. Well, if that's what you're here for, I suppose you'll want to talk to the police... Lieutenant Marquardt is in the library. That's where it happened. Oh, the library, huh? Well, that might help. If I can't find any other answers, I can always try looking some up in a book. Which way do I go? The door, just across the hall. Thank you. And what a hall. The only thing missing was old Queen Victoria herself. Even the musty odor clinging to the green velvet seemed to have been passed down through the centuries. There was a brace of moth-eaten pheasants on the wall and a bouquet of moth-eaten flowers under glass on a marble top side table. The library was the same. But there were three things that looked out of place. A, an old suit of armor. B, a glass case filled with new, well-polished sporting rifles and shotguns. And C, a very gruff-looking lieutenant of the police who eyed me as I came in. And who are you? Oh, here. Here's my little breath saver. Oh, yeah, Johnny Dollar. He told me you'd be here. Well, I've told everybody else, I better tell you, don't touch anything. They want to re-fingerprint the whole room. Okay, okay. What'd you find, Lieutenant? Nothing but the cadaver with two bullet holes in his back. Haven't got a caliber report from ballistics yet. Have you an estimated time of departure? Yeah, the coroner says Martin died after dinner last night. Uh Uh-huh. Anything to go on? Just the usual. Faith, hope, and suspicion. 
His wife, too young and too pretty for an ugly old buck like Martin, must have married him for his money. Then there's that housekeeper, Sarah Tompkins. Yeah, I met her on the way in. And she used to be the old man's intended, from what I can find out. Probably jealous of the young wife. Then there's the brother, Marty. He showed up a few weeks ago, broken brooding. Probably in love with the young wife. And then there's Nick Bellotti, a private detective who hired himself out as Martin's bodyguard. Bodyguard, huh? No doubt also in love with the young wife. Could be. Who's your choice? Except for the fact that there are only two bullets, I think they all did it. The nose through which Lieutenant Mark would talk was a long one. And in more ways than one, a horn of plenty. For out of it had poured enough motives and suspects to furnish a dozen murders. I started through this cast of characters and found that all of them had very little to say and didn't want to say it. The first I dug up was the bodyguard, my brother investigator, Nick Pilati, as he returned from a horseback ride. Glad to have you on the case, Stella. The police have tied my hands. They told me to stay out of it, but to stick around. Have you got any ideas? Everybody seems to think it was an inside job, that somebody in the household did it. I'm not so sure. The reason I was around was because old man Martin made too many dollars and too many enemies doing it. But that's only my opinion. Why don't you talk to the old boy's younger brother, Marty? I found Marty living the life of Riley. He was upstairs in his room, cuddled up to a 20-year-old bottle of brandy, which was still underage to be around as the kind of book he was reading. Yeah, I'll tell you something, Toller. My brother and I never did get along. Yeah, you'd find that out anyway. Why'd you come back here, Marty? Because Loyal's little bride, Joy Ann, sent for me. She was afraid of him, and she didn't know if he was on to her. Was he? <laughs> About that, you'll have to talk to Joy Ann. <laughs> Joy Ann didn't get home until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I caught up with her 20 minutes later as she came dripping out of the swimming pool. The suit she was wearing would have gotten her pinched on the Riviera. Oh, that was refreshing. Well, uh, it certainly is. Oh, uh, toss me that towel, will you? Yeah, surely. Here, Mrs. Martin. Uh, Joy Ann, I hate formality. Who are you? Well, I'm from the insurance company, here to find out whether you killed your husband or not. Hmm, good for you, Mr. Dollar. That's what I like. Men who get right down to the point. I was told you were here. Oh? Nobody told me about you. Oh, come on over and learn. I want to stretch out here in the sun. Here. You man the fly water. Okay. Come on, sit down. Here beside me. If it gets too warm, slip off your shirt. Oh, thank you. Well, suppose we start talking business. Marty tells me you sent for him to come here because you were afraid of your husband. How come? Well, I knew Marty before I knew Loyal. As a matter of fact, he's the one who introduced me to. Uh, what do you call a dead husband? You call him unlucky, I guess. Anyway, for the purposes of this conversation, I'll know who you mean if you just say husband. But you didn't answer my question. I meant, were you afraid of your spouse? And if so, why? Yes, I was afraid of him. Oh, I might as well tell you, Mr. Dollar. I want to be frank with you. The only thing Loyal didn't have to offer me was love. I seem to be a girl who needs just that. Frankly, I, I tried to make up the deficit. Mrs. Tompkins, the housekeeper, saw to it that my husband found out about it. From then on, it was like living with a madman. So endeth my confession. So beginneth my suspicion. What about this housekeeper? Until I came along, she always thought that Loyal would wind up marrying her. No, don't get me wrong. I realize that I'm still the best jury bait around. If you killed him, you might make some headway with a self-defense plea. Thanks. I remember that. In the meantime, just in case this thing gets messy for me, and it shows signs, I'm going to spend what's left of my free time enjoying myself. Well, that won't sound good to a jury, but it sounds good to me. If I spend too much time around here, I might wind up having to plead self-defense myself. Oh? From me? No. From that bathing suit. I spent the rest of the afternoon trying to keep two eyes on four people, reading from left to right. 
Brother Marty stayed in his room, finishing his book and his brandy. Nick Bellotti, the bodyguard with no body to guard, got back on his horse and cantered off into the sunset. The joyous widow, Joy Ann, locked herself in her room, and all I could get through the keyhole was the sound of a light and lovely snore. I couldn't tell whether it was the genuine article or not. Having no way of checking, I picked up the trail of Sarah Tompkins, the housekeeper. She, at least, was apparently up to no good. I found her in the library doing just what Lieutenant Mark would have told her not to do, smearing the surfaces of Mr. Martin's desk with a dust rag. And as anybody knows, you can't fingerprint a dust rag. Hey, cut it out! How dare you? Mr. Martin's private study. Those are the police private fingerprints you're messing up. I was doing nothing of the sort. I was dusting his desk. I always do it at this time of day. Get out of here. You don't belong in here. Keep your wig on, Mrs. Tompkins. I'll not be told what to do by outsiders. Everything was all right until outsiders started coming in. If it wasn't for outsiders, Loyal would still be alive. First that girl, then his brother and that detective. Now it's the police and you. Why did any of you have to come here? Why couldn't you leave us alone? <laughs> now calm down, Mrs. Tompkins. Try to calm down. Yeah, now, what's going on in here? What? Oh... And what are you two lovebirds up to? It's all right, Lieutenant. I'll tell you about it later. All right, but get her out of here. I've got some looking to do privately. Take her down to her room and then come back. You mean you got something hot? It ain't cold. Okay, Mrs. Tompkins, come on. <laughs> but I haven't finished in there. Come on, you can get it later. There's just time for you to take a little rest before dinner. Oh, but I never rest this time of day. He didn't like me to. Mrs. Tompkins, come on, tell me. Really. Why were you wiping off that desk? Those police this morning scattered white powder all over his desk. He would have been furious with me. He hated any kind of... The shots had come from the library, and that's where I went, but not fast enough. By the time I got there, Lieutenant Markwood was dead, and whoever had done the shooting was gone, apparently through an open window. Markwood still clutched the shotgun he'd grabbed out of the gun case but hadn't had a chance to use. Two things had just died in that room. The lieutenant and the hot piece of evidence he'd never had the chance to pass on to me. In just a moment, we return to the second act of Johnny Dollar. But first... The cream of the wit and the best of the music, which Arthur Godfrey brings you in the daytime on CBS, can now be heard on Godfrey's Digest, a new Saturday evening show heard on most of these same CBS stations. Listen tomorrow night and hear the week's fastest flashes of the Godfrey humor, the top song sung by Jeanette Davis and Bill Lawrence, the finest singing of the Mariners. Arthur Godfrey's Digest and the Goldbergs are the latest addition to CBS's great Saturday night. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Hey, what happened? Oh, Markwood. Yeah, he's dead. Well, what are you doing, Sawyer? I'm looking for what there seems to be a shortage of around here, Bellotti. Clues. You don't mind where you look, do you? Rule number one, don't get caught frisking dead cops. Forget about it, Bellotti, will you? Maybe I can suffer from lapse of memory for you sometime. That's a deal. Got any idea what you're looking for? No. But whatever it was, it was important enough to get him killed. I'd hope maybe there'd be something in his notebook, for instance. Any luck? Well, very little. It's a brand new book, only one notation in it. Here it is. Check tattooing diameter. Recheck penetration. What do you make of that? It's too scientific for me. I'm a skip case and divorce type detective myself. All I know is you'd better put that book back in his pocket and leave it there. Yeah, I guess you're right. A nice timing, Bellotti. And remember, thanks for the loss of memory. Forget it. Hey, what happened? What's going on here? Oh, good Lord. Lieutenant Markwood. Who did it? Dealer's choice. So far, the dealer's the only one who knows. First my brother, now Lieutenant Markwood. There'll be... Real trouble about this? Johnny, shall I call the police? Drop the innocent access for law. I'll call them. No, maybe i better do it, Marty. If everybody will stop pleading not guilty by wanting to call the police, I'd like to get a word in. The police have already been called. Now, if you'll get out of here, I'd like to try earning my salary. If I 
had had longer ears and more soulful eyes, I would have been all bloodhound because I could sniff out the first of the trail. The smell of court, I told me, that Lieutenant Markwood's killer had either been inside the room when he fired or just outside with the weapon pointed through the still open window. Outside, the grass formed a deep, wet rug right up to the house and smothered any immediate hopes I'd had of finding footsteps. But ten feet away, I had better luck. A ray of light from inside spotlighted something that looked like it might be a star witness. It was a 32 caliber revolver. I scooped it up with my handkerchief and went back through the open window to look it over. Under the light, I checked six empty chambers and a crimson smear on the walnut grip. If somebody was feeding me a herring, it sure was red. But it wasn't blood. It was lipstick. I'd like to introduce myself, Dollar. I'm Sergeant Norrin McDougal. How are you, Sergeant? Ah, poor Markwood. Thank the Lord he didn't have any wife and kids. I'm glad to hear that. Cops usually do. Well, there's one good thing about it. When a police officer goes, there's plenty of them that lives on to fight back. All the police in the world. You can throw in the private ones, too, Sergeant. Thanks, Dollar. And now, maybe I'd better take your statement. Well, it won't take long. I heard the shots from the hallway, and I came back. He was killed either from inside the room or just outside the window. I didn't get a look at the killer, but I found what might be the murder gun. Here it is. Now, watch that handkerchief. Mm. Thirty-two caliber. Yeah, how does that match up with the gun that killed old man Martin, do you know? Same caliber. Uh-huh. Huh. I wonder what he was doing with this shotgun. It ain't loaded, and Mark would knew better than to wave an unloaded gun in the face of a full one. Did you get anything else out of ballistics, Sergeant? Yeah. Uh, headache. Dollar, what we got from ballistics don't add up with what we got from autopsy. Well, how's that? Those two slugs ended Martin's body an inch and a half apart. But, according to the shallow penetration, they were fired from a distance of 300 yards. Now, do you know anybody who could do that kind of shooting with a 32? Well, that's pretty fancy shooting. Could it have been done with a stationary mount? No, not a chance. The body would have started falling after the first shot. And you can't re-aim a stationary mount that fast. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, I didn't have a chance to spend much time with Markwood before he got it, so I, I don't have much to work on. You got anything to spare? Just a lot of routine confusion so far. You know yourself, Dollar. You take four witnesses, you're bound to get at least two different stories. Uh, two of the people that heard the shooting when Martin got killed last night said they heard two shots. The other two ear witnesses said they heard one. The only thing the whole four agree on is that they didn't see anything. Well, that sounds familiar. Thanks anyway, Sergeant. Sure, anytime. Hey, Sam. Yeah? Take this gun into town. Tell ballistics to run it through for fingerprints and check it against those slugs in the Martin case. I want to report right away. I hitched the ride with that gun into the ballistics department. While waiting for the test to be made, I asked some questions and I came up with a real brain buster. Despite the fact that the penetration report said that Martin had been shot from a distance of 300 yards, his skin and clothing had been tattooed with powder indicating the shots had been fired at close range. The tree that little puzzler put me up would have made the giant redwood forest look like a hedge. Then they gave me the ballistic report. The lands and grooves scored into the slugs by the revolver barrel proved that both Loyal Martin and Lieutenant Markwood had been killed by the 32 caliber gun I'd picked up in the yard. No prints on it. Registered owner, the young lady who looked much better in a bathing suit than she'd ever look in the electric chair. The widow, Joy Ann Martin. Yeah? Who is it? The Hartford Horseshaw. Dollar, I want to talk to you. Oh, I'll be with you in a second. I'm just out of the shower. Okay. First she was in the pool, now it's the shower. She's also in plenty of hot water. Hi. Don't pay any attention to my hair. Hmm. Don't worry, I won't. Uh, I suppose you think it's a silly time of night for me to be taking a shower. But I thought it might help me to get to sleep. Well, I'm afraid I won't. Why, Johnny. You, uh... You were pretty careless with that gun, weren't you? What gun? 
Oh, that handy little 32 caliber gun with a handy little registration number engraved on it that told the nasty old police that you bought it six weeks ago. Oh, oh my gun's right here in the drawer. I, I bought it to protect myself from my husband. Oh, Johnny. Johnny, it's gone. It's real gone. It's done gone and killed two men so far. And if you can't do some fast talking and some fast proving, it stands a good chance of shortening your pretty little life expectancy. Somebody must have stolen it. Oh, no. That's not even a down payment on a story. Oh, but, Johnny, there's a whole house full of people who could have done it. Not only that, they'd, they'd be glad to get me out of the way if they could. Why? Well, Mrs. Thompson, because she hates me. Hoyle's brother, Marty, because I stand to inherit everything. What about Nick Bellotti? Doesn't he have an axe to grind? I don't know what it could be. Okay, skip it. Tell me, do you remember hearing two shots being fired around here any time before your husband was killed? Probably away from the house? Why do you ask that? Because I want to know, did you? You amaze me. Yes, I did hear two shots. The day before Loyal was killed. I was horseback riding down by the walnut grove. I remember because my horse shied. Well, this is coming a bit too readily to be readily believed. But how big is that walnut grove? It's not very big. Yeah? Can you spot those shots a, a little closer? They sounded as if they came from about the middle. I, I didn't stay to find out. I, I guess I frightened easily. Yeah. Yeah, you frightened me easily. Why, Johnny? Why? I'll tell you why. Because whether you shot anybody or not, you're a murder, baby. Oh, Johnny. I didn't kill them. Got to believe me, Johnny. Uh uh. I don't have to. But just for a minute, I will. What is there about police drivers? Even out in the country, they got to lay on those sirens. Johnny, please. Come on, you better get dressed, sweetheart. I told them I'd keep you occupied till they got here. Why, you... The police took Joanne and her hurt feelings off to the pokey. I took myself and my hurt cheek off to bed. The next thing I had to do had to be done by daylight. So I took over Joanne's painfully empty and prettily perfumed sack, set the alarm for dawn, and snored up a storm. I never knew before how much went on in the country so early in the morning. On the way to the walnut grove, the damp air washed the cobwebs out of my head, and I started thinking. Now, first, Royal Martin had been found dead with two bullet holes in him, yet two of the witnesses, Joy Ann and the housekeeper, Mrs. Tompkins, had heard only one shot. Second, that powder burn tattooing on the body, denoting a close-range killing, was in violent argument with a bullet penetration report which screamed long-range killing. Those facts added to what was in Lieutenant Markwood's notebook, plus that shotgun clutched in his dead hand, came close to tallying up the total that had cost him his life. Inside the grove, I found four walnut trees with hollows in their trunks. The first one gave me a handful of nuts and a fancy sassing by an irate squirrel. The second one... Came up with a handful of spunk water and a wet cuff. And the third, I found what I was looking for. I found about two pecks of clean cotton waste. That is, clean, except for some powder burn. Everything was falling into place, including a blunt instrument which hit me on the head from behind. But before I hit the ground, I saw Brother Marty Martin legging it back towards the house. I made it up the house and into, up the hill and onto the trail. I was just starting up the stairs when I heard another out-of-season 4th of July. It's okay, Bella. I got him. Yeah. Yeah. So I see. It was self-defense. I had to do it. I hated to butt in on your case, but all of a sudden everything stacked up and I knew he was your man. When I threw it in his teeth, he made a try for his gun, so I dropped him. You sure did, Bellotti. Well, I owe you a lot of thanks. But if you don't mind, I'll take over from here. Sure, help yourself. Good. 
And uh, I think the first thing you'd better do is hightail it into town, get your story filed with the police. Yeah, I guess you're right. You're all straight now, so you can back me up. 100%, Nick, all the way. Now get going. Come on. Okay, Donna. See you later. <laughs> Sergeant Norman McDougal. Yes, sir. Sergeant McDougal. Johnny Dollar, Sergeant. Oh, yeah, Dollar. Uh, what's new? Well, just another corpse. And in just about 15 minutes, the guy who made it one and conspired on the other two killings is going to walk right into your arms through the station house door. What? Who is it? Nick Bellotti, New York private license. He just shot his partner in this thing, Marty Martin. You're crazy. What about this girl? It was her gun. That was their fondest hope, Sergeant, to pin it on her. They borrowed her gun, fired two slugs from it into some cotton waste, then took the slugs and stuck them in a shotgun shell. One shot, just like both ladies said they heard. The shotgun Lieutenant Markwood was looking at when he died was really the Martin murder weapon. Oh, that takes care of the powder burns and the shallow penetration, yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Dollar. I'll be waiting for him. Wait a minute. What's he walking in here for under his own power? To tell you an early morning bedtime story, just before you go off duty. He'll give you a pitch about a self-defense killing. It's a lie. The victim wasn't carrying a gun. If he had been, he would have used it on me. But he didn't. He used a sap. The sap. <laughs> Expense account, item 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. $624 entertainment. Appeasing a rich widow with rich taste. Expense account, items 1 through 13 inclusive. $160 entertainment of poor insurance investigators with extravagant taste. Expense account, item 14. $7.80 mileage, New York to Hartford. You may disagree with that item claiming that I finished the case in Fairfield County. But I didn't finish the case until I left her. And New York City is where I left her. Expense account total, $823. Signed, yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Truly, Johnny Dollar stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd, with music composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Edmund O'Brien can currently be seen starring in the Harry M. Popkin United Artist production, D.O.A. Featured in our cast were Irene Tedrow, Walter Burke, Ted DeCorsia, John Daner, Gene Bates, and Ed Begley. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Join us again next week when Edmund O'Brien returns in another adventure of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Ladies and gentlemen, CBS invites you to hear Senator Brian McMahon on the Capitol cloakroom over most of these same Columbia stations tomorrow night. Senator McMahon is chairman of the Joint Congressional Committee on Atomic Energy. And when he's interviewed by CBS newsmen Eric Severide, Bill Shadell, and Griffin Bancroft, this will be the first detailed discussion of the hydrogen bomb and its implications. Remember the first discussion by a high government official since President Truman's historic announcement earlier this week. Remember that CBS's Capitol Cloakroom, tomorrow night at 10.30 p.m., over most of these same CBS stations. Be sure and be listening. This is CBS, where, incidentally, Arthur Godfrey's digestive wit and humor is also heard every Saturday night. The Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>